the buffer fringe. In the first half of the 20th century, the power structure of the world was entirely transformed. In 1900, European civilization, led by Britain and followed by other states at varying distances, was spreading outward, disrupting the cultures of other societies, unable to resist and frequently without any desire to resist. The European structure, which pushed outward, from, uh, formed a hierarchy of power, wealth, and prestige with Britain at the top, followed by a secondary rank of other great powers, but a ter tertiary rank of the wealthy secondary powers, uh, like Belgium, the Netherlands, and Sweden, and by a, a quadern quaternary rank of uh, lesser or decadent powers, like Portugal or Spain, whose world positions were sustained by British power. At the turn of the 20th century, uh, the first cracklings of impending disaster were emitted from this power structure, uh, but were generally, generally ignored. In 1896, the Italians were massacred by the Ethiopians at Adawa. In 1899 <clears throat> through uh, 1902, the whole might of Britain was held, back, held in check by the small Boer republics in the South African War, and in 1909, 04 to 1905, Russia was defeated by a resurgent Japan. These omens were generally not heeded. The European and, and European civilization continued on its course to Armageddon. By the second half of the 20th century, the power structure of the world presented a quite different picture. In this new situation, the world uh, consisted of three great zones. One, Orthodox civilization under the Soviet Empire, occupying the heartland of Eurasia. Two, surrounding this, a fringe of dying and shattered cultures, Islam, Islamic, Hindu, Malayan, Chinese, Japanese, Indonesian, and others. And three, outside this fringe, and chiefly responsible for shattering it, its, its, its cultures, was Western civilization. Uh, moreover, uh, Western civilization had been uh, profoundly modified. In 1900, it, it had consisted of a core area in Europe with peripheral areas in the Americas, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and the fringes of Africa. By, uh, by 1950, Western civilization had its center of power in America. The fringes in Africa were being lost, and Europe had been so reduced in power and wealth and in prestige that it seemed to many that it must, be, it must make the choice between becoming a satellite in an American-dominated Western civilization or joining, joining with the buffer fringe to try to create a third force able to hold a balance of power between America and the Soviet bloc. This impression was mistaken, and by the, by the late 1950s, uh, Europe was in a position, once again, to play an independent role in world affairs. In previous chapters, we examined the background of Western civilization of the Russian Empire to the second decade of the 20th century. In the present chapter, we shall examine the situation in the buffer fringe un until about the end of that same decade. At the beginning uh, of the 20th century, the areas uh, which were to become the buffer fringe consisted of... <coughs> The Near East dominated by the Ottoman Empire, the Middle East dominated by the British Empire in India, and the Far East consisting of two old civilizations, China and Japan. On the outskirts of these were the lesser colonial areas of Africa, Malaysia, and Indonesia. At this point we shall consider the three major areas of the buffer fringe with a brief glance at, at Africa. For the space over a century, uh, from shortly after after the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815 until 1922, the relationships of the great powers were exacerbated by what was known as the Near East Question. This problem, which arose from the growing weakness of the Ottoman Empire, was con concerned with the question of what would become of the lands of the peoples left without government by the retreat of the Turkish power. The problem was made more complex by the fact that Turkish power did not withdraw, but rather decayed right where it was so that in many areas it continues to exist in law when it had already ceased to function in fact because of the weakness and corruption of the sultan's government the turks themselves sought to maintain their position not by remedying their weakness and uh, corruption by reform but by playing off one european state against another and by using cruel and arbitrary actions against any of their sub subject peoples who dared to become restive under their rule the Ottoman Empire reached its peak in the period 1526 to 1533 with the conquest of Hungary and its first siege of Vienna. The second siege, also unsuccessful, came in 1683. 
From this point, Turkish power declined and Turkish sovereignty withdrew. But unfortunately, the decline was uh, much more rapid than the withdrawal, with the result that subject peoples were encouraged to revolt and foreign powers were encouraged to intervene because of the weakness of Turkish power in areas which were still not nominally under the Sultan's sovereignty. At this height, the Ottoman Empire was largely was larger than any contemporary European state in both area and population. South of the Mediterranean, it stretched from Atlantic Ocean and Morocco to the Persian Gulf. North of the Mediterranean, it stretched from the Adriatic Sea to the Caspian Sea, including the Balkans as far north as Poland and the whole northern shore of the Black Sea. This vast empire was divided into 21 governments and subdivided into 70 vilayets, each under a pasha. The whole structure was held together as a tribute gathering military system by the fact that the rulers in all parts were Muslims. The supreme ruler in Constantinople was not only Sultan and thus the head of the empire, but was also Caliph and thus defender of the Muslim creed. In most of the empire, the masses of the people were Muslims like the rulers, but in much of the empire, the masses of the peoples were non-Muslims, being Roman Christians, Orthodox Christians, Jews, or, or other creeds. Linguistic variations were even more notable than religious distinctions. Only the peoples of Anatolia generally spoke Turkish, while those of North Africa and of, Near and of the Near East spoke various Semitic and Hamitic dialects, of which the most prevalent was Arabic. From Syria to the Caspian Sea across uh, the base of Anatolia were several languages, of which the chief were uh, Kurdish and Armenian. The, the shores of the Aegean Sea, especially the western, were generally Greek-speaking. The northern shore was a confused mixture of Turkish, Greek, and Bulgarian-speaking peoples. The eastern shore of the Adriatic uh, was Greek-speaking up to the 40th parallel, then Albanian for almost three degrees of latitude, merging gradually into the various South Slav languages like Croat, Slovene, and in the interior, Serb. The, the, the Dalmatian shore in Istria had many Italian speakers. On the Black Sea shore, Thrace uh, itself was a mixture of Turkish, Greek, and Bulgar, from the Bosporus to the 42nd parallel, where there, were, there was a solid mass of Bulgarians. The Central Balkans was a confused area, especially in Macedonia, where Turkish, Greek, Albanian, Serb, and Bulgar met and mingled. North of the Bulgarian-speaking groups, and generally separated from them by the Danube, were Romanians. North of the Croatians and Serbs, and generally separated from them by the Drava River, were the Hungarians. The distinction, the, the, the distinct, distinct were the Hungarians and the Romanians uh, met. Transylvania was confused with the great blocks of one language being separated from their fellows by blocks of the other and confusion being compounded by the presence of considerable numbers of Germans and Gypsies. The religious and lingui linguistic uh, divisions of the Ottoman Empire were complicated by geographic, social, and cultural divisions, especially in the Balkans. Th this last named area provided such contrast as the relatively advanced commercial and mercantile activities of the Greeks. Primitive pastoral groups like Albanian goat herders, subsistence farmers scratching a living from a small plots of Macedonia's rock soils, uh, peasant-sized farms on the better soils of Serbia and Romania, a rich, uh, great uh, rich landed uh, estates producing for a commercial market and, and, and worked by serf labor in Hungary and uh, Romania. But such diversity made any hopes of political unity by consent or by federation almost impossible in the Balkans. Indeed, it was almost impossible to draw any political lines uh, which would coincide with geographic and linguistic or, or religious lines because linguistic and religious distinctions frequently indicated class distinctions. Thus, the upper and lower classes, or the commercial and the agricultural groups, even in the same district, often had different languages or different religions. Such a pattern of diversity could be held together most easily by a simple display of military force. This was what the Turks provided. Militarism and, and fiscalism were the two key notes of Turkish rule and were quite sufficient to hold the empire together as long as both remained effective and the empire was f free from outside interference. But in the course of the 18th century, Turkish administration became ineffective and outside interference became important. The, the Sultan, who was a, uh, was a completely absolute ruler, became very quickly a completely arbitrary ruler. This characteristic extended to all of his activities. He filled his harem with any women who pleased his fancy without any formal ceremony. Such numerous and temporary liaisons produced numerous children, of whom many were neglected or even forgotten, 
Accordingly, the succession to the throne never became established and was never based on primogeniture. As a consequence, the Sultan came to fear murder from almost any direction. To avoid this, he tended to surround himself with persons who could have no possible chance of succeeding him. Women, children, Negroes, eunuchs, and Christians. All the Sultans from 1451 onward were both of slave mothers and only one Sultan after this date ever bothered to contract a formal marriage. Such a way of life isolated the Sultan from his uh, subjects completely. This isolation applied to the process of government as well as to the ruler's personal life. Most of the sultans paid little heed to government, leaving this to their grand advisors and the local pashas. The former had no tenure being appointed or removed in accordance with the whims of harem intrigue. The pashas tended to become increasingly independent since they collected local taxes and raised local military forces. The fact that the sultan was also caliph and thus religious successor to Muhammad and a religious belief that the government was under divine guidance and should be obeyed, however unjust and tyrannical, made all religious thinking on political or social questions take the form of justi justification of the status quo and made any kind of reform almost impossible. Reform could, only, uh, could come only from the Sultan, but his ignorance and isolation from society made him unlikely. In consequence, the whole system became increasingly weak and corrupt. The administration was chaotic, inefficient, and arbitrary. Almost nothing could be done without gifts and bribes to officials, and it was not always possible to know of what official or series of officials were the correct ones to reward. The chaos and weakness uh, which we have described were in full blossom by the 17th century and grew worse during the next 200 years. As early as 1699, the Sultan lost Hungary, Transylvania, Croatia, and Slovenia to the Habsburgs, parts of the Western Balkans to Venice, and districts in the north to Poland. In the course of the 18th century, Russia acquired uh, areas north of the Black Sea, notably the Crimea. During the 19th century, the Near East question became increasingly accurate. Russia emerged from the Napoleonic Wars as a great power, able to increase its pressure on Turkey. This pressure resulted from three motivations. Russian imperialism sought to win an outlet to open waters in the south by dominating the Black Sea and by winning access to the Aegean through the acquisition of the Straits in Constantinople. Later, this effort was supplemented by economic and diplomatic pressure on Persia in order to reach the Persian Gulf. At the same time, Russia regarded itself as the protector of the Orthodox Christians in the Ottoman Empire, and as early as 1774 had obtained the Sultan's consent to this protective role. Moreover, as, as most powerful Slav state, Russia had ambitions to be regarded as the protector of the Slavs in the Sultan's domains. These Russian ambitions could never have been thwarted by the Sultan alone, but he did not need to stand alone. He generally found support from Britain and increasingly from France. Britain was obsessed with the need to defend India, which was a manpower, pool, and a military staging area vital to the defense of the whole empire. From 1840 to 1907, it faced a nightmare possibility that Russia might uh, attempt to cross Afghanistan to the northwest India, or cross Persia to the Persian Gulf, or penetrate through the Dardanelle, Dardanelles and the Aegean onto the British lifeline to India by way of the Mediterranean. The opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 increased the importance of this Mediterranean route to the east in British eyes. It was protected by British forces in Gibraltar, Malta, acquired in 1800, Cyprus in 1878 was acquired, and Egypt uh, in 1882 was acquired. In, in general, in spite of the English humanitarian sympathy for the people subject to tyr tyranny of the Turk, and in spite of England's regard for the merits of good government, British imperial policy considered that its interests would be safer with a weak, if corrupt, uh, Turkey in the Near East than they would be with any great power in that area, or with the area broken up into small independent states which might fall under the influence of the great powers. French, the, the French concern with the Near East was parallel too, but weaker than that of Britain. They had a cultural they had cultural and, uh, cultural and uh, trade relations with the Levant, going back, in some cases, to the Crusades. In addition, the French had ancient claims, re revived in 1854, uh, to be considered the, the protectors of the Roman Catholics in the Ottoman Empire and of the holy places in Jerusalem. Three other influence which became, influences which became increasingly strong in the Near East were the growth of nationalism and the growing interests of Austria after 1866, and of Germany after 1889. The first stirrings of uh, Balkan nationalism can be seen in the revolt of the Serbs in 1804 to 1812. 
By seizing uh, Bessarabia from Turkey in 1812, Russia won the right for local self-government for the Serbs. Unfortunately, the latter be, uh, these latter uh, began almost immediately to fight one another. The chief split between uh, a Russia, Russophile group led by Milan Obrenovic and a Serb nationalist group led by George Petrovic, better known as Kara George. Uh, the Serb state, formally established in 1830, was bounded by the rivers uh, Vina, Sav, Danube, and Timok. Uh, with lo local autonomy under Turkish uh, suzerainty, it, it continued to pay tribute to the Sultan to support garrisons of Turkish troops. A vicious feud between Abrenovic and Karadjordjevic uh, continued after Serbia obtained complete independence in 1878. The Abrenovich dynasty ruled in 1817 to 1842 and 1858 to 1903, while the Kura Georgia Georgia Vic group uh, ruled in 1842 to 1858 and 1903 to 1945. The intrigues of these two against each other uh, broadened into a con constitutional conflict in which the Abrenovich group supported the the. the uh, somewhat less liberal constitution of 1869, while the Kara Georgievic group uh, supported the somewhat more liberal constitution of 1889. The former constitution was in effect in 1869 to 1889, and again in 1894 to 1903, while the latter was in effect in 1889 to 1894, and again in 1904 to 1920, 1921, uh, 1903 to 1921. In order to win popular support by an appeal to national sentiments, both groups plotted against Turkey and later against Austria-Hungary. A second example of Balkan nationalism appeared in the Greek a struggle for independence from the Sultan in 1821 to 1830. After Greeks and Muslims uh, had massacred each other uh, by the thousands, Greek independence was established with a constitutional monarchy under the guarantee of the three great powers. Uh, a Bavarian prince was placed on the throne and began to establish a centralized bureaucratic constitutional state which was quite unsuited for a country with such unconstitutional traditions, poor transportation and communications, and a low level of literacy and high level of partisan localism. After 30 turbulent years, 1832 to 1862, Otto of Bavaria was deposed and replaced by a Danish prince in completely democratic unicameral government which functioned only slightly better. The, the Danish dynasties continued to rule, although supplanted by a republic in 1924 to 1935, and by military di dictatorships on sundry occasions, notably that of Johannes Metaxas, 1936 to 1941. The first beginnings of Balkan na nationalism must not be overemphasized. While the inhabitants of the area have always been unfriendly to outsiders and resentful of burdensome governments, these sentiments deserve to be regarded as pro provincialism or localism rather than nationalism. Such feelings are prevalent among all primitive peoples and must not be regarded as nationalism unless they are so wide as to embrace the loyalty to all peoples of the same language and culture and are organized in such fashion that this loyalty is directed toward the state as the core of nationalist strivings. Understood in this way, nationalism became a very potent factor in the dis disruption of the Ottoman Empire only after 1878. Closely re related to the beginnings of Balkan nationalism were the beginnings of the Pan-Slavism and the various Pan-movements in reaction to this, such as Pan-Islamism. Uh, these rose to a significant level only at the very end of the 19th century. Simply defined, Pan-Slavism was a movement for cultural unity and perhaps in the long run political unity among the Slavs. In practice, it came to mean the right of Ru Russia to assume the role of protect protector over the Slav peoples outside Russia itself. At times, it was difficult for some people, especially Russia's enemies, to distinguish between Pan-Slavism and Russian imperialism. Equally simply defined, uh, Pan-Islamism was a movement for unity, or at least cooperation among all Muslim peoples in order to resist the encroachments of the European powers on Muslim territories. In concrete terms, it also sought to give the Caliph a religious leadership and perhaps in time a political leadership such as he had already he, he had really never previously possessed. But of these uh, pan movements are, are of no importance until the end of the 19th century. While Balkan nationalism was only slightly earlier than they in its rise to importance.
these Balkan nationalists had romantic dreams about uniting peoples of the same language and generally looked back to the distorted historical perspective to some period when their co-linguists had played a more important political role. The, Gre the, the Greeks dreamed of a revived Byzantine state or even of a Periclean Athenian empire. The Serbs dreamed of the day of uh, Stephen Deshan, while the Bulgars went further back to the days of the Bulgarian Empire of Simeon in the early 10th century. However, we must remember that even as late as the beginning of the 20th century, such dreams are found only among the educated minority of Balkan peoples. In the 19th century, agitation in the Balkans was much more likely to be caused by Turkish misgovernment than by stirrings of national feeling. Moreover, when national feeling did appear, it was just as likely to appear as a feeling of animosity against neighbors who were different rather than a feeling of unity with peoples who were the same in culture and religion. And at all times, localism and class antagonisms, especially rural hostility against urban groups, remained at a high level. Russia made war on Turkey five times in the 19th century. On the last two occasions, the great powers intervened to prevent Russia from imposing its will on the Sultan. The first intervention led to the Crimean War of 1854 and 1856 through 1856 and the Congress of Paris 1856, while the second intervention at the Congress of Berlin in 1878 rewrote a peace treaty which the Tsar had just imposed on the Sultan, the Treaty of San Stefano in 1877. In, in 1853, the Tsar, as protector of the Orthodox Christians of the Ottoman Empire, occupied the principalities of Moldavia and Wallachia, north of the Danube and east of the Carpathians. Under British pressure, the Sultan declared war on Russia and was supported by Britain, France, and Sardinia in the ensuing Crimean War. Under threat of joining the anti-Russian forces, Austria forced the Tsar to evacuate the principalities and occupied them her herself, thus exposing an Austro-Russian rivalry in the Balkans which continued for two generations and ultimately precipitated the World War of 1914 to 1918. The Congress of Paris of uh, 1856 sought to remove all possibility of any future Russian intervention in Turkish affairs. When the integrity of Turkey was guaranteed, Russia gave up its claim and as protector of the Sultan's Christian subjects. The Black Sea was neutralized by prohibiting all naval vessels and naval arsenals on its waters and shores. An international commission was set up to assure free navigation of the Danube, and in 1862, after several years of indecision, the two principalities of Moldavia and Wallachia, along with Bessarabia, were, all, were allowed to form the state of Romania. The new state remained technically under Turkish uh, suzerainty until, until 1878, it was the most progressive of the successor states of the Ottoman Empire, with advanced education and judicial systems based on those of Napoleonic France and a thoroughgoing agrarian reform. This last, which executed in two stages, 1863 to 1866 and 1918 through 1921, divided up the great estates of the church and nobility and wiped away all vestiges of manorial dues or serfdom. Under a liberal but not democratic constitution, uh, a German prince, uh, Charles of Hohenzollern, Ho 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 Hohenzollern Sigmaringen, Meringen, Hohenzollern Sig Sigmaringen, 1866 to 1914, established a new dynasty which was ended only in uh, 1848. Uh, during this whole period, the cultural and educational system of the country continued to be oriented toward France in sharp contrast to the inclinations of the ruling dynasty, which had German sympathies. The Romanian possession of Bessar Bessarabia and their general pride in their Latin heritage, as reflected in the name of the country, uh, set up a barrier to good relations with Russia, although the majority of Romanians were members of the Orthodox Church. The political and military weakness of the Ottoman Empire in the face of the Russian pressure and Balkan nationalisms uh, made it obvious that it must uh, westernize and it must reform if it was going to survive. Broad verbal promises in this area were made by the Sultan in the period 1839 to 1877, and there were even certain efforts to execute these promises. The army was reorganized on the European basis uh, with the assistance of Prussia. Uh, local government was reorganized and centralized, and fiscal system greatly improved, <coughs> uh, chiefly, uh, chiefly by uh, curtailing the use of tax farmers. Uh, government uh, officials were were shifted from a, a fee basis to a salary basis. Uh, 
uh, the slave market was abolished, although this meant a large reduction to Sultan's income. Uh, the religious monopoly in education was curtail curtailed and a considerable impetus given to secular technical education. And, um, finally, in 1856, in an edict forced on the Sultan by the great powers, an effort was made to establish a secular state in Turkey by abolishing all inequalities based on creed and respect to personal freedom, law, property, taxation, and eligibility for office or military service. In practice, none of these paper reforms was very effective. It was not possible to change the customs of the Turkish people by paper enactments. Indeed, any attempt to do so aroused the anger of many Muslims to the point where their personal conduct toward uh, non-Muslims became worse. At the same time, uh, these promises led the non-Muslims to expect better treatment so that the relations between the various groups were exacerbated. Even if the Sultan had had every intention of carrying out his uh, state reforms, he would have had extraordinary difficulties in doing so because of the structure of the Turkish society and the complete lack of trained administrators or even of literate people. The Turkish state was a theor theocratic state. The Turkish society was a patriarchal or even tribal society. Any movement towards secularization or towards social equality could easily result not in reform but in complete destruction of the society by dissolving the religious and authoritarian relationships which held both the state and society together. But the, but the, the movement uh, toward reform lacked the wholehearted support of the Sultan. It, it aroused the opposition of the more conservative and in some ways more loyal groups of the Muslims. It, it, it aroused the opposition of many liberal Turks because it was derived from the Western pressure on Turkey. It aroused opposition from many Christian or non-Turkish groups who feared that a successful reform might weaken their chances of breaking up the Ottoman Empire completely. In the efforts at reform, being aimed at the theocratic character of the Turkish state, counteracted the Sultan's efforts to make himself the leader of pan-Islamism and to use his title of caliph to mobilize non-Ottoman Muslims in India, Russia, and the East to support him in his struggles with the European Greek powers. On the other hand, it was equally clear that Turkey could not meet any European state on the basis of military equality until it was westernized. At the same time, the cheap machinery made in industrial products of Western powers began to pour into Turkey and to destroy the ability of the handicraft artisans of Turkey to make a living. This could not be prevented by tariff protection because the Sultan was bound by international agreements to keep his custom duties at a low level. At the same time, the appeal of Western ways of life began to be felt by some of the Sultan's subjects who knew them. These began to agitate for industrialism or for railroad construction, for wider opportunities in education, especially technical education for reforms in the Turkish language and for new, less formal, kind of Turkish literature, for honest and impersonal methods of administration and justice and public finance, and for all those things which, uh, by making the Western power strong, made them a danger to Turkey. The Sultan made feeble efforts to reform in the period 1838 to 1875, but by the la latter date he was completely disillusioned with these efforts and it shifted over to a policy of ruthless censorship and repression this repression led, at last, to the so-called Young Turk Rebellion of 1908. The shift from feeble reform to merciless repression coincided with a renewal of the Russian attacks on Turkey. These attacks were incited by Turkish butchery of Bulgarian agitators in Macedonia and a successful Turkish war on Serbia. Appealing to the doctrine of pan-Slavism, Russia came to the rescue of the Bulgars and Serbs and quickly defeated the Turks, forcing them to accept the Treaty of San Stefano before any of the Western powers could intervene in 1877. Among other provisions, this treaty set up a large state of Bulgaria, including much of Macedonia, independent of Turkey and under Russian military occupation. This Treaty of San Stefano, uh, especially the provision for a, a large Bulgarian state, which it was feared would be nothing more than a Russian tool, was completely unacceptable to England and Austria. Joining with France, Germany, and Italy, they forced Russia to come to a conference at Berlin where the treaty was completely rewritten in 1878. The, the independence of Serbia, Montenegro, and Romania was accepted, as were the Russian acquisitions of Kars and Batum, east of the Black Sea. Romania had to give uh, Bessarabia to Russia, but received Dobrija from the Sultan. Bulgaria itself, the crucial issue of the conference, was divided into three parts. A. The strip between the Danube and Balkan mountains was set up as an autonomous and tribute-paying state under Turkish suzerainty.
B, the portion of Bulgaria south of the mountains was restored to the Sultan as the province of Eastern Rumelia to be ruled by the Christian governor approved by the powers. And C, Macedonia, still farther south, was restored to Turkey and returned for promises of administrative reforms. Austria was given the right to occupy, occupy Bosnia, Herzegovina, and the Sanjak of Novi Bazar, a strip between Serbia and Montenegro. The English, by a separate agreement with Turkey, received the island of Cyprus to hold it as long as Russia held Batum and Kars. The other states received nothing, although Greece submitted claims to Crete, Thessaly, Epirus, and Macedonia, while France talked about her interest in Tunis and Italy made no secret of her ambitions in Tripoli and Albania. Only Germany asked for nothing and received the Sultan's thanks and friendship for its moderation. The Treaty of Berlin of 1878 was a disaster from almost every point of view because it left every state except Austria with its appetite whetted and its hunger sat unsatisfied. The Pan-Slavs, the Romanians, the Bulgars, the South Slavs, the Greeks, and the Turks were all disgruntled with the settlement. The agreement turned the Balkans into an open powder keg from which the spark was kept away only with great difficulty and only for 20 years. It also opened up the prospect of liquidation of the Turkish possessions in North Africa, thus inciting a rivalry between the great powers which was a constant danger to the peace in the period 1878 through 1912. The Romanian loss of Bessarabia, the Bulgarian loss of Eastern Romelia, the South Slav loss of its hope of reaching the Adriatic or even of reaching Montenegro because of the Austrian occupation of Bosnia and Novi Bazar. Uh, the Greek failure to get Thessaly or Crete in complete discomfiture of the Turks created an atmosphere of general dissatisfaction. In the midst of this, the promise of reforms to Macedonia without any provision for enforcing this promise called for forced hopes and agitations which could neither be satisfied nor quieted. Even Austria, which on the face of it had obtained more, she, more than she could uh, really have expected, had obtained in Bosnia the instrument which was to lead eventually to the total destruction of the Habsburg Empire. This acquisition had been encouraged by Bismarck as a method of diverting Austrian ambitions southward to the Adriatic Sea and out of the and out of Germany. But by placing Austria in this way, the position of being the chief obstacle in the path of the South Slav dreams of unity, uh, Bismarck was also creating the occasion for the destruction of the Hohenzollern Empire. It is clear that Europe, uh, European di dip diplomatic history from 1878 to 1919 is little more than a commentary on the mistakes of the Congress of Berlin. Uh, to, Ru <coughs> to Russia, the events of 1878 were a, a bitter disappointment. Uh, even, even the small Bulgarian state, uh, Bulgarian state which emerged from the settlement gave them little satisfaction. With the constitutional, di with the constitution uh, dictated by Russia and under a prince, Alexander of uh, Bat Battenberg, who was a nephew of the Tsar, the Bulgarians showed an uncooperative uh, spirit which profoundly distressed the Russians. <coughs> As a result, when Eastern Romania re revolted in 1885 and demanded union with Bulgaria, the change was opposed by Russia and encouraged by Austria. Serbia, in its bitterness, went to war with Bulgaria, but was defeated and forced to make peace by Austria. The union of Bulgaria and Eastern Romania was accepted on face-saving terms by the Sultan. Russian objections were kept within limits by the power of Austria and England, but were strong enough to force the abdication of Alexander of Battenberg. Prince, of, Prince Ferdinand of Saxe-Coburg-Gotha was elected to succeed Alexander, but was unacceptable to, the, to Russia and was reorganized by none other none of the other powers until his re reconciliation with Russia in 1896. The state was generally in turmoil during this period. Plots and assassinations steadily followed one another. The Macedonian revolutionary organization known as IMRO, working for independence for the area, adopted an increasingly terrorist policy, killing any Bulgarian or Roma Romanian statesman who did not work wholeheartedly in cooperation with their efforts. <coughs> Agitated Bulgarians formed insurgent bands which made raids into Macedonia and insurrection became endemic in the province, bursting out in full force in 1902. By that date, Serb and the Greek bands had joined in the confusion. The powers intervened at that point to inaugurate a program of reform in Macedonia under Austro-Russian Austro -Russian supervision. <coughs> 
the Congress of Berlin began the liquidation of the Tur Turkish position in North Africa. France, which had uh, been occupying Algeria since 1830, established a French protectorate over Tunis as well, as well in 1881. This led to the British occupation of Egypt the following year. Not to be outdone, Italy put in a claim for Tripoli, but could get no more than an exchange of notes, known as the Mediterranean Agreement of 1887, by which England, Italy, Austria, Spain, and Germany promised to maintain the status quo in the Mediterranean, the Adriatic, the Aegean, and the Black Seas, unless all parties agreed to changes. The only concrete advantage to Italy in this was a British promise of support in North Africa in return for Italian support of British position in Egypt. This provided only a tenuous satisfaction for the Italian ambitions in Tripoli, but it was uh, reinforced in 1900 by a French-Italian agreement by which Italy gave France a free hand in Morocco in return for a free hand in Tripoli. By 1900, an entirely new factor began to intrude into the Eastern question. Under Bismarck, 1862 to 19, 18, 1890, Germany had uh, avoided all non-European adventures. Under William II, 1888 to 1918, any kind of adventure, especially a remote and uncertain one, was welcomed. In the earlier period, Germany had concerned itself with the Near East question only as a member of the European Concert of Powers. And with, with a, a few incidental issues, such as the use of German official officers to train the Turkish army. After 1889, the situation was different. Economically, the Germans began to invade Anatolia by establishing trading agencies and banking facilities. Politically, Germany sought to strengthen Turkey's inter international position in every way. This effort was symbolized by the German Kaiser, uh, Kaiser's two visits to the Sultan in 1889 and 1898. On the latter occasion, he solemnly promised his friendship to the Sultan Abdul Hamid and the 300 million Mohammedans who re revere him as caliph. Most important, perhaps, was the projected Berlin to Baghdad railway scheme, which completed its main trunk line from the Austro-Hungarian border to Nusaybin in northern Mesopotamia by September 1918. This project was the greatest economic, strategic, and political importance, uh, not only to the Ottoman Empire and the Near East, but to the whole of Europe. Economically, it tapped a region of great mineral and agricultural resources, including the world's greatest petroleum reserves. These were brought into contact with Constantinople, and beyond that, with Central and Northwestern Europe. Germany, which was industrialized late, had a great unsatisfied demand for food and raw materials, and a great capacity to manufacture industrial products which could be exported to pay for such food as raw materials for, for such food and raw materials. Uh, efforts had, had been made and continue to be made by Germany to find a solution to this problem by opening trade relations with South Africa, the Far East, and North America. Uh, banking facilities and merchant marine uh, were being used established uh, to, uh, to, to encourage such trade relations. But the Germans, with their strong strategic sense, knew well that relations with the areas mentioned were at the mercy of the British fleet, which would almost unquestionably control the seas during wartime. The, Ber the Berlin to Baghdad railway solved these crucial problems. It put the German metallurgical industry in touch with the great metal resources of Anatolia. It put the German textile industry in touch with the supplies of wool, cotton, and hemp of the Balkans, Anatolia, Mesopotamia. In fact, it brought to almost every branch of German industry, industry the possibility of finding a solution for its critical market and raw material problems. Best of all, these connections of being almost entirely over land would be within reach of the German army and beyond the reach of the British Navy. <coughs> for, for Turkey itself, the railway was equally significant. Strategically, it was it made possible for the first time uh, for Turkey to mobilize her full power in the Balkans, the Caucasus area, the Persian Gulf, or the Levant. It greatly increased the economic prosperity of the whole country. It could be run as it was after 1911 on Mesopotamian petroleum. It provided markets and thus incentives for increased production of agriculture and mineral products. It greatly reduced the political discontent, public disorder, and banditry in the area through which it ran. It greatly increased the revenues of the Ottoman treasury in spite of the government's engagement to pay subsidies to the railroad for each mile of track built and for a guaranteed income for per mile each year. Uh, the great power sh showed a mild approval of the Baghdad Railway until about 1900. 
Then for more than 10 years, Russia, Britain, and France showed violent disapproval and did all they could to obstruct the project. After 1910, this, this disapproval was largely removed by a series of agreements by which the Ottoman Empire was divided into exclusive spheres of influence. During the period of disapproval, the great powers concerned issued such a barrage of propaganda against the plan that it, it is necessary even today to warn against its influence. They described the Baghdad Railway as the entering wedge of German imperialist aggression seeking to weaken and destroy the Ottoman Empire and this, the stakes of the other powers in the area. <coughs> the evidence shows quite the contrary. Germany was the only great power which wanted the Ottoman Empire to be strong and intact. Britain wanted it to be weak and, and weak and intact. France generally shared the British point of view, although the French, with a 500 million investment in the area, <coughs> wanted Turkey to be prosperous as well. Uh, Russia wanted it to be weak and partitioned, a view which was shared by the Italians and, to some extent, by the Austrians. Germany, the Germans were, were not only favorable, uh, favorably inclined toward Turkey. Their conduct seemed to seemed to have been completely fair in regard to the administration of the Baghdad Railway itself. At a time when uh, American and other railways were practicing wholesale discrimination between customers in, the, in regard to uh, rates and freight handling, the, the Germans had the same rates and same treatment for all, including Germans and non-Germans. They worked to make the railway, the railroad They worked to make the railroad efficient and profitable, although their income from it was guaranteed by the Turkish government. In consequence, the, the Turkish payment uh, to the railroad steadily declined, and the government was able to share in its profits to the extent of almost 3 million francs in 1914. Moreover, the Germans did not uh, seek to monopolize control over the railroad, offering to share equally with France and England and eventually with the other powers. France accepted this offer in 1899, but Britain continued to refuse and placed every obstacle in the path of the project. When Ottoman government in 1911 uh, sought to raise their customs duties from 11 to 14 percent in order to finance the continued construction of the railway, Britain prevented this. In order to carry on the project, Germans sold the railroad interest in the Balkans and gave up the Ottoman building subsidy of 275,000 uh, a kilometer, dollars a kilometer. In striking contrast to this attitude, the Russians forced the Turks to change the original route of the line from northern Anatolia to southern Anatolia by threatening to take immediate measures to collect all their areas, amounting to over 57 million francs uh, due to the Tsar from Turkey under the Treaty of uh, 1878. The, Russian, the Russians regarded the, project, the projected railway as a strategic threat uh, to their Armenian frontier. Ultimately, in 1900, they forced the Sultan to promise to grant no concessions to build railways in northern Anatolia or, or Armenia, except with a Russian approval. The French government, in spite of the French investments in the Turkey of in, in Turkey of 22.5 billion francs, refused to allow Baghdad railway securities to be handled on the Paris Stock Exchange. To block the growth of German Catholic missionary activities in the Ottoman Empire, the French persuaded the Pope to issue an encyclical ordering all missionaries in the empire to communicate with the Vatican through the French consulates. The British opposition became intense only in April 1903. Early in that month, Prime Minister Arthur Balfour and Foreign Secretary Lord Lansdowne made an agreement for joint German, French, and British control of the railroad. Within three weeks, this agreement was repudiated by a government because of the newspaper protests against it although it would have reduced the Turks and Germans uh, together to only 14 out of the 30 votes on the board of directors of the railway. When the Turkish government in 1910 uh, tried to borrow abroad 30 million secured by the you know, customs receipts of, this, of the country, it was summarily rebuffed in, in, in Paris and in London, but obtained the sum without hesitation in Berlin. If you, in view of these facts, the growth of German prestige and the decline in favor of the Western powers at the Sultan's court is not surprising and goes far to explain the Turkish intervention on the side of the Central Powers in the War of 1914-1918. to The Baghdad Railway played no real role in the outbreak of the War of 1914 because of the Germans in the period 1910-1914. to They were able to reduce the Great Powers' objections to this scheme. This was done through a series of agreements which divided Turkey into spheres of foreign influence. In November 1910, a German-Russian agreement at Potsdam, Potsdam gave Russia a 
free hand in northern Persia, withdraw Russian opposition to Baghdad Railway, and pledged both parties to support equal trade opportunities for all the open door policy uh, in, in their respective areas of the influence in Near East. In the Near East, uh, the French were given 2,000 miles railway concessions in western and northern Anatolia, and in, and in Syria in 1910 and 12. And, and signed a secret agreement with the Germans in February 1914, by which these regions were recognized as French spheres of influence. While the route of, ba of the Baghdad Railway was recognized as a German sphere of influence, both powers promised to work to increase the Ottoman tax receipts. The French withdrew their opposition to railway, and the French gave the Germans the 70 million franc investment, which the French already had in the Baghdad Railway, in return for an equal amount in the Turkish bond issue of 1911, which France had earlier rebuffed, plus a lucrative discount on a new Ottoman bond issue of 1914. The British drove a much harder bargain with the Germans, but in agreement of, 19, of, of June 1914, uh, Britain withdrew her opposition to Baghdad Railway, allowed Turkey to raise her customs from 11% to 15%, and accepted a German sphere of interest along the railway route in return for promises. Uh, one, that a railway would be uh, extended to the Persian Gulf, but would stop at the Basra on the Tigris River. Two, the British capitalists would be given a monopoly on the navigation of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers and exclusive control over irrigation projects based on these rivers. Three, that uh, uh, two British subject, subjects would be given seats on the board of directors of the Baghdad Railway. Four, that, the, uh, that Britain would have excluded control over the commercial activities of Kuwait, the only good port on the upper Persian Gulf. Five, uh, that a monopoly over the oil resources of the area from Mosul to Baghdad would be given to a new corporation in which British finances would be would have a half interest Royal Dutch Shell Company a quarter interest and the Germans a quarter interest and six that both powers would support the open door policy and commercial activities in Asiatic Tur Turkey unfortunately this agreement as well as the earlier one ones with other powers became worthless with the outbreak of the First World War in 1914. However, it's still important to recognize that the Entente powers forced upon the Germans at a settlement dividing uh, Turkey into spheres of interest in place of the projected German settlement based on international cooperation in the economic reconstruction, uh, reconstruction of the area. These, struggle, uh, these struggles of the great powers for profit and influence in the wreckage of the Ottoman Empire could not fail to have profound effects in, in Turkish domestic affairs. Probably the great mass of the Sultan's subjects were still untouched by these events, but, in, in, but an animated minority was deeply stirred. This minority received no encouragement from the despotic Abdul Hamid II, Sultan from 1876 to 1909. While eager for economic uh, improvements, Abdul Hamid II was uh, opposed to the spread of the Western ideal, ideas of liberalism, constitutionalism, nationalism, or democracy, and did all he could to prevent their propagation by censorship, by restrictions on foreign travel and study abroad by Turks, and by an elaborate system of arbitrary police rule and governmental espionage. As a result, the minority of liberal, nationalistic, or progressive Turks had to organize abroad. This they did at Geneva in 1891 in a group which is generally known as the Young Turks. Their, their chief difficulty was to reconcile the animosities which existed between the many linguistic groups among the Sultan's subjects. This was done in a series of congresses held, by, held in Paris, notably in 1902 and in 1907. At the latter meeting uh, were representatives of the Turks, Armenians, Bulgars, Jews, Arabs, and Albanians. In the meantime, this secret organization had penetrated the Sultan's army, which was seething with dis discontent. The plotters were so successful that they had that they were able to revolt in July of 1908, and it forced the Sultan to reestablish the Constitution of 1876. At once, divisions appeared among among the rebel leaders, notably uh, notably between those who, who wished a centralized state and those who accepted the subject's nationalities uh, demands for a centralization. Moreover, the Orthodox Muslims formed a league to resist secularization, and the army soon saw that its chief demands for better pay and improved living conditions were not going to be met. Abdul Hamid uh, took advantage of these divisions to organize a violent counter-revolution in April 1909. It was crushed, the Sultan was deposed, and the Young Turks began to impose their ideas of dictatorial Turkish national state with ruthless severity. A wave of resistance arose from the non-Turkish groups and the Orthodox Muslims.
no settlement of these disputes was achieved by the outbreak of the of the World War in 1914. Indeed, uh, as we shall see in a later chapter, the Young Turk Revolution of 1908 uh, precipitated a, a series of international crises, of which the outbreak of war, uh, of war in 1914 was the latest and most disastrous.